You're watching Drake Queen Gaming. Enjoy the video. Hey guys and gals, Neri here from Drake Wing Gaming. It's some of you to me on Twitter, the Gaming Dragon. Today I'm coming back at you another Let's Play episode of In Case of Emergency, Wes's Path. So yeah, before we jump into it, just wanted to let y'all know that our Patreon is now up. With a little of $5, y'all can help support the channel, get some awesome rewards like permanent access to our community Discord server and full access to upcoming Not Safe for Work videos. Anyway, y'all, let's go ahead and jump right back in. Alarm chain, you are up, and let's go. Alright. This isn't real. Can we talk about this? Take another step. As you stumble towards the dick, the pain in your leg tells you you're making the right choice. He's not real. None of this is. Kira, please. The dick lies at your feet, waiting for you to pick it up. Whether it's calling you or taunting you, he can't tell. Reach for it. You reach for the dick in the sand. You wish you could say that your body moves of its own accord, but the truth is that it's much more difficult. The world seems to, st seems to still as your hand stretches out for the item. The waves slow in the middle of their crests, and the clouds freeze in the sky. The fog around your mind starts to lift, and it's all starting to come back. The night in the tavern, the talk by the creek, falling into the void. Kirit, please stay with me, even if it's just for another night. I want you. We can have something here. You know it won't be the same when you go back. He won't love you like I do. There's nothing back there you can't have here, but better. Kirit, if you go back, you're going to be alone. Pick up the dick. You open your mouth to offer a rebuttal, but you don't have one. He's right, in a way. If you leave, there's no guarantee that you'll ever have what you had here. But that's, you figure, the point. Yep. <laughs> you grab the dildo by the shaft, and the world grinds to a final halt. All sounds stop, and it's like you're standing in the vacuum of space. Push on. You limp into the void. Dildo is still clutched in one hand, leaving everything be leaving behind everything you wanted for a chance at something, anything else. In the darkness, you walk for what seems like an eternity. Your ankle burns as you hobble through the emptiness. Your hand still clenched around the dick like it's a lifeline. For all you know, it is. What is this place? You look around for any identifying landmarks, but there's nothing other than the void as far as the eye can see. Ow! Your foot recoils in pain from the sharp object you stepped on. Bending down to pick it up, you find a thin wooden rail, about three inches long and two wide. Hello? Is, is anyone out there? Only the silence responds. You're alone. No, I'm not. You're there, aren't you? Clearly you know who I am and what I want. What happened back there? That was all you, wasn't it? So tell me what to do. Keep walking. You keep walking. The void stretches out in front of you, no horizon to speak of. Finally, after a long moment, you hear the sound of rushing water in the distance. At this point, you're grateful to hear anything other than the sound of your own voice. You race towards the sound as best you can with your one good leg. In the distance, you spot an enormous cascading waterfall, thunderous in the empty void. What is this place? This is the void. Great, thanks, I got that part, but why am I here? How do I get back? All things that are lost in Peregrine must pass through here. This is where they are recycled and repurposed into something new. You cannot return to Peregrine because this is Peregrine, don't you see? As you approach the waterfall, you realize that its flow never quite reaches the ground. Before it does, it dissipates into the air and seems to float to the void. Its particles warp before your very eyes. You recognize it as what was happening to you when your hand became transparent. You are becoming unraveled. You are being mined, unraveled, mined, harvested so that you could give birth to a new world. Okay, okay, I get it. I'm just thread or raw materials or whatever. Is that what happened to everyone else who came through here? Remus mentioned there were others before me. They got chopped up and processed down here, turned into more of the world. They were given everything they wanted, like you, just like you. Had you stayed, you would have eventually become like them. Mountains and rivers, landmarks and lives. Except I left. Except you left. You could have stayed and been happy. Wasn't that what you wanted? Why wasn't it enough? Why did you leave? I was dying? Oh, I don't know, maybe because, maybe because I was literally disappearing by staying here? Thank you now. Water time. <laughs> I don't worry, y'all. I will rewind back and uh, see what happens after that night with Wes. If you choose not to lay down with him. And give of yourself sexually. Anyway. You experience what you can only describe as the universe shrugging. You can do whatever you like. All things must come to an end, but you have to know, your return will not be easy. Where's Wes? 
When you fell, your friend jumped in after you. He's currently in his own pocket of void, much like the world you were once in. If you wish to leave, you will have to find him and bring him with you. Your anchor tethers you to the layer above Peregrine, the world you came from. You feel the dick buzz in your hand. It will always bring you closer to the world from which it originated. But before you can return home, you will have to pass through Peregrine once more. But how? How do we get back home from there? Just as an item. Just as an item anchors you to the world above, so too does an object forged from void anchor you to the world below. Your hand instinctively reaches for the scabbard looped around your hip. At some point during your journey down here, it had rematerialized at your side. I mean the sword. I have to get rid of it? If you were to break the cycle and leave, all artifacts must be returned to the void, the place from whence they came. You drum your fingers along the cold palm of your blade. Despite everything, you don't want to let it go. You feel robbed of your time here, and a part of you still wants more. It wants to hold on to the sand slipping past your fingers. But standing here in the emptiness of the void, it feels nearly impossible to articulate this. Is this what you want? What kind of price are you willing to pay to linger a little longer in this world? There's only one way out, and that way is through. You take a deep breath, gathering what little remains of your mental reserves. Nothing but darkness lies before you. You're scared, but the promise that there's some kind of existence at the end of this, even if it's not the existence you want, gives you strength. You exhale, grip the dick stuffed in your pocket tighter, and keep going. At long last, you encounter the steel doors to an elevator. Floating next to them are a sleek panel with a single circular button embedded in it. You press it, and the button lights up. The elevator door opens, ushering you in. The box hums to life as it travels, upwards you assume, as the floor numbers stick, tick higher and higher. Something cold trickles against your hand, and you realize you're holding the foil-covered stem of a champagne bottle. Somehow it's still cold. Barely any condensation is formed in the dark green glass. Eventually the elevator slides to a smooth stop, like hitting the brakes on a powerful car, and the doors open onto an office floor. Some people look up from where they're working, briefly make, eye, briefly make bored eye contact with you, then quickly turn back to their work. You're pretty sure you don't work here. Uh, he's over there. Someone takes pity on your lost kid in a mall look and nods towards the corner office with its shutters closed. No one spares you or you or your bottle a second glance as you walk towards it. You can't tell if it's because you belong here or if it's because you don't. As you approach the office door, you notice there's no name in the empty placard on the wall on the door. You push the door open. <laughs> hey, what are you doing here? West smiles at you, turning away from the windows along the wall. Outside, you see the skyline of a city you've never seen before, let alone from this high, on, this high of a floor. Despite everything, your heart still skips a beat when you see him. Is that for me? Wes crosses over to you and takes the champagne from your hand, his tail snaking around the back of your knee before he returns to his desk. Your knees wobble a little at a touch. You're not some kind of lovesick puppy, at least not anymore, but it's hard not to want more. You clear your throat and attempt to clear your head. If you're going to convince Wes to leave, you need to figure out what's happening. So, what's going on? Is this your office? You didn't know? I thought it's what the champagne was for. Celebrate my new promotion. From somewhere you can't see, Wes produces two glass flutes and sets them on his desk. With a practice floor, she peels off the foil covering and removes the wire cage. Whoa! Wes recoils, laughing as the foam spills over the lip of the bottle onto his knuckles. He shakes his head clean as he pours you two glasses. Second, y'all. Water time. Cheers! Your heart sinks for a reason you can't name yet. Promotion? You got promoted? Yep, this is all mine now. Wes clinks glasses with you and sips. Drink. You can't do it, man. You hold the stem of the glass between your fingers without drinking. It doesn't feel right to partake right now. Wes wipes his hand on a handkerchief, and you catch the glint of a familiar ring on his finger. The churning feelings in your stomach harden into a pit as all your worst fears are confirmed. He can't believe that, even in his wildest fantasies, Wes can't imagine a world without his obligations. Hey, can we talk for a second? Wes smiles at you blithely, sipping from his flute. What's up? You gesture around the office, trying to prepare your point. Wes, this, this isn't real. You jumped in the void after me and Peregrine, and we end up in these fantasy worlds that are trying to harvest us. This office, this view, it's just a world reflecting back at you what you want to see. You have to come with me, and we have to go back to the real world. Wes frowns, pausing in the middle of his sips. And suddenly, he laughs. Against your will, the butterflies in your stomach are sent a flutter. If there's, ever more, if there's ever been more proof that the heart wants what it wants, it's this moment here. Ha! You're always so funny, Kieran. I wish I could take you to this party. I wish I could take you to this party with me. You don't think you could write a speech for me, do you? Party? What party? 
We're celebrating my promotion to operations director. My dad's gonna be there. I should probably thank him or whatever. Sorry, I'm no good at writing speeches for people who are still living. You don't want to indulge him, but the response comes to you automatically. As your brain catches up to what Wes said, you realize, Hang on, why am I not invited to this party? Wes laughs as he corks an eyebrow. Uh, is this another joke? He sounds a little concerned, like he's afraid you're asking a trick question. We talked about this. I can't be seen with you at company functions, but that doesn't mean I care about you any less. What does that mean? Wes flushes. You know, I care about you. I want us to be together. What else does it mean? You're saying we can be together in private. We just can't let anyone know we're together. You feel like an idiot arguing about this imaginary predicament, dragged into someone else's fantasy and acting out a fight in a relationship that's not even your own. Wes sighs, downing his glass and reaching over to take yours. As he leans in, you get a whiff of his cologne and, underneath it, his own scent. It's still him beneath it all. You're not sure if that makes everything better or worse. Is everything okay, Karen? Is this really what you want? What do you mean? I, I'm happy here. This is, this is what I want. I don't think this is what you want. Maybe you think this is what you want, but it's just you internalizing what other people have wanted for you. I mean, look around. Is this really what you want out of your life? The corner office, a fat paycheck, stock options, and a company car? Okay, so I'm not really selling this, but don't you want more? Don't you feel like all these things are just going to leave you feeling empty in the end? Wes frowns, and he has the decency to look ashamed as he studies the carpet without answering. Look, I get it. Your parents want you to get married to someone. Maybe they're homophobic, or maybe they're not, and... No, they actually voted liberal eight years ago. Hey, that doesn't mean... That's not my point! Besides exasperation. How can one person be so selfish while also caring so much about what other people want from him? Rest for coils, coolly having taken offense at your words. Why are you so mad about this all of a sudden? You're the one who wanted to keep things casual. You throw your hands up in the air and make a noise of frustration. Wes, don't you get it? This isn't real. The person that told you that wasn't actually me. It was just a version of me that this world made for you. You're just being shown whatever it is you want to see. Wes opens his mouth to respond and freezes as the weight of your words finally sets in. He looks embarrassed, like you've walked in on him watching something inappropriate, except you've actually seen his porn on his TV. He was much less mortified then. There you go. Water time. Alrighty. Alrighty. It occurs to you faintly that this is unfair, that you get to see what he wants, and all its selfishness, but that he still hasn't seen your own fantasy of who you wanted him to be. Your face burns at the memory of the things you'd apparently wish he'd say to you. There's nothing quite as humiliating as wanting something that the other person doesn't. From Wes's desk, the black office phone rings. No one moves to answer it. After an excruciatingly long time, it goes to the answering machine, and a man's voice comes from the speaker. Wesley, I just wanted to congratulate you on the promotion. You've still got a long road ahead of you, but I know you're going to make a great leader one day. I don't say it enough, but if it's today, well, shucks, you did good. I'm proud of you, son. And then the line goes dead. Wes crosses his arms and stares at his fancy carpeted floor. You don't know what to say. In another world, you probably would have been getting a similar phone call. After a long moment, Wes raises his head to take a hard look at the office. Expensive-looking mahogany table, the elaborate paperweights, the million-dollar view, are settling on the blinking landline. He shrugs and looks away. Yeah, maybe you're right. I sure hope you are. Right now, the only thing you're certain of is that nothing makes this conversation sting any less. You hold out the dick for him to take. Balls first. What a line. Is that? It's a long story. If you take it, we can portal through the void and go back to where we came from. We'll have to go through the heart again first, through Peregrine, but after that we can actually go home. For real. And if I stay? If things go back to the way they were? We walk over to the abandoned glasses of champagne and hold one out for him to take. Wes tries to grab it, scrunches his brow, then tries again. His hand passes through its stem and through your fingers, reaching for something he can't have. I don't know, but if you stay, the world's just gonna keep feeding off of you until there's nothing left. You set the glass down and offer the dick again in its place. Wes's hand reaches out, hovering over it, hesitant. You can already see the color returning to his hand. The more he questions what he's seeing, the harder it is for it to retain its hold on him. But he doesn't take it quite yet. There's just one thing I don't get. If this is really supposed to be everything I ever wanted, if the Void is reading my mind to give it to me, then why, even here, why aren't I happy? 
He turns to you, as though you might hold all the answers. When you make eye contact, you realize for maybe the first time that Wes is no older than you are. In fact, you know that he's a year below you in school and more than likely younger than you. For all his expensive furniture, parties, and responsibilities, Wes is playing pretend at being an adult just as much as you are. Alright, I'm going to go ahead and pause it right there. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and your notification bell, and check out our Patreon if you can. It always helps. Anyway, I love you all. I'll see you all in the next video. Bye-bye!